Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I am not Sarah Hennewald. I'm Brad Rathgaber, the head of school of One Schoolhouse, and I have the pleasure of hosting today's webinar. Um, so, and we are thrilled to have with us Jeff Shields, uh, the CEO of the National Business Officers Association, NBOA. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. So thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. So we have a couple of housekeeping things that I just want to note here at the start before I jump into some questions for Jeff. Um, the first is just yesterday. Oh, sorry. I, I guess I'm ahead of myself on the blog. Uh, on the blog this week, uh, you'll note some uh, some of my thoughts on academic leaders' roles in finance and operations, which Jeff will add to greatly here during today's webinar. Next week's webinar is on what wellness means in the next normal. So what wellness means in a post-COVID pandemic world. We also wanted to note that uh, we have just yesterday released a whole set of new courses on our website for students this coming fall. We're hearing that many schools are going to have a small number of students, two to 12% or so, who can't return to campus this fall, and that there also may be families or students who are requesting increased flexibility in their schedules. So in response, we've expanded our course catalog to include more courses that are typically required for graduation. If you have any questions about this program, please don't hesitate to reach out to Liz Cates on our team who can help with that. Here are all the new courses we announced just yesterday. Uh, as part of this core course uh, offering. And uh, coming up, uh, we also want to note, oh, sorry, that advanced independent curriculum work is also up for you to be able to download uh, the copy of the principles and standards. And we have some summer professional development related to this. And we have additional summer professional development that is on its way. You can check out all of that at oneschoolhouse.org. Great, okay, Jeff. So I'm going to start with just a thanks here um, the, the pandemic made super clear that the work of business and operations is absolutely essential mm -hmm. to meeting the mission of our schools. Academic leaders depended on business operations of schools like never before. So just on behalf of the academics leaders community to the business and operations community, thank you to every business mm -hmm. officer, controller, HR professional, yes. facilities officer, IT leaders, and more mm -hmm. who just helped make this year happen. Well, I, I appreciate that and on, on behalf of business officers. Uh, thank you for that recognition. Um, I recently had an opportunity to uh, talk with uh, technology leaders uh, at the Atlas conference and, and videotaped a message for them and thank them as well. So my message here is that um, it was not a singular effort by anybody. It was really the collective uh, that made it work. And, and I just want... Um, uh, all the academic leaders that are watching this webinar today to know that at least from my perspective, the health and safety of our faculty and staff and the health and safety of our students was always the North Star uh, throughout the pandemic. And um, that that team of people uh, worked nights, weekends, uh, et cetera, et cetera, along with faculty to to make make this work. So I think it was, uh, I'm gonna talk about collaboration maybe a little bit later, but um, it was certainly a collaborative effort, but your recognition is much appreciated. Absolutely, absolutely. And thank you for noting that North Star. I think that everybody mm -hmm. can relate to that. Um, so let's start by jumping into collaboration. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how the business office and academic leadership can effectively partner to meet the challenges of the current moment. And let's just say that, that is emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic and more broadly, just the mission of the school. Well, I, I think this is becoming increasingly uh, more potent for independent schools. And the reason I say that is, is because of the collaboration I just noted, that there was, there was no possible way to be successful through the pandemic uh, if we operated in silos and weren't reaching across the aisle, yeah. um, et cetera, et cetera. And I will tell you um, that I, I continue to be in conversations with my colleagues from other associations, CASE, uh, NEIS, uh, EMA, TABS. And we really, as, as association leaders, wanna continue this mantra of the importance of collaboration, um, support it as a, an essential 
leadership skill, not just for the head of school, but all the senior leaders on the administrative team, and certainly the academic leaders as well. And now that we have what I consider to be a case study that it worked and it works so well for so yes. many schools, why not continue it to take on the other uh, uh, big challenges? Um, so, so collaboration, I think, is key. It's it's continued to be key. But I will tell you, the lack of collaboration has been an issue since I began my tenure at MBOA eleven years ago. So mm -hmm. this this uh, at least this idea that we don't collaborate as much as we can or should um, continues to be out there. So we really want to uh, use that in our programs, our resources, and and our our uh, talking points when we speak to different groups and and uh, continue to talk about the merits of it and how it produces results that I think are helpful to the mission of the school, certainly helpful in serving students and families uh, across the board. Absolutely. Well, so let's talk about a potential area for, for joint work. Um, one thing we keep hearing from academic leaders is that it's really difficult to interpret the data that's coming at them right now. Yeah. That data seems to be all over the place and it's difficult to understand where comparisons might be. Mm -hmm. Are we looking at 2019, 2020? I'd imagine that this is something that's on the business officer's mind right now too. As, as you start to look through and try to interpret what you're seeing. Well, I mean, I think one thing we learned about the pandemic was, and one thing we weren't really used to, right? We knew, we know how to run summer programs. We know how to get a school year started. You know, we know how to get through mid-year and, and deliver spring, uh, spring programs and, and curriculum and get to commencement. We knew all that. I think the pandemic really uh, forced us to operate in ambiguity. And yeah. so I wish I could tell you um, that there was a data point to look at um, or data points that would, would help folks with the budget. I guess my message is two things. One is that um, uh, partner with your business officer if you have questions or challenges, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and because uh, the business officers that are operating at a, at a real leadership level at their schools need, need the input from from others in order to put forward a best case scenario. But we're talking about put forward your best thinking with a budget and have scenario A and have scenario B at the ready because we don't know for certain what this next year would bring. I continue to be hopeful. I continue to be optimistic. I, I hope we're not operating at kind of the fevered pitch uh, and, and at that stressful level throughout next year. But, but I think business officers are looking at scenario planning for next year in a lot of different areas, enrollment, program, uh, hybrid models, et cetera, et cetera. I think the second thing I'd like to share with your audience in particular, Brad, is that I, I want academic leaders to keep in mind about where they can have the greatest impact on the budget. Yep. And that's it's really, it's still FTE. In fact, FTEs are where we all have impact on the budget. And, and you know, you and I have presented together, we've talked together a lot really quickly. We know that compensation and benefits is gonna be the highest line item at any school we see. We know that tuition is the, excuse me, expense line item, that tuition is the highest revenue item. So, so we're not talking about academic leaders making an impact on, um, on, on supplies and on even field trips, et cetera, et cetera. But we are talking about FTE and the opportunity presented by the pandemic is rethinking the delivery of our curriculum. We trained a whole slew of faculty this last year in online and distance learning. How are we gonna leverage that investment? That in the long term can make a significant impact on the budget. So I know I didn't answer the first part of your question, but I, I do think there's a important um, a sandbox for academic leaders to operate within, to share their learnings and where they see programs going and, and how we deliver them is key in the future. Yeah, let's pause on that actually for a second, Jeff, because I, I, I kind of want to put an exclamation point behind something you just said there, right? Okay. So I, I think that one thing that became clear during the pandemic is that FTEs, uh, our full-time employee equivalent, our faculty members, that's the largest investment that we make at a school. And yet sometimes an academic leader can think very carefully about um, their departmental budget or other costs that go on. And even during this year, right? Like mm -hmm. PPE costs or yep. HVAC, ventilation costs. Yep. I'm thinking yep. that those- Plexiglass, things, that's my plexiglass, favorite. Plexiglass, right. In reality though, those are just a small portion of the budget compared to 
the faculty costs compared to the full FTE costs of the school. Well, I think, uh, and I agree with you, in general circumstances, I do think a number of schools had to invest so heavily yes. in those, in those what, what I hope are one-time or maybe two-time costs this past year. Um, even if they implemented testing protocols, that was another huge yes. expense driver. And schools had to staff up at least temporarily in order to meet the demands of the pandemic. But you're absolutely right. Um, I think the conversation going forward in the budget with uh, your uh, senior administrator uh, team is to say, how can we uh, change or, or differentiate uh, how we deliver our programs in ways that uh, will have not only uh, impactful uh, financial impact on the budget, but will have long-term financial impact on the budget. And, and again, and it's a dialogue, it's a conversation yeah. and, and, and it's, and it's an iterative process. We didn't get here overnight. You know, we won't, we won't solve all of our financial challenges overnight, but I, I do think the academic, uh, our academic leaders have such an important voice because, you know, I, what I've always said, Bar Brad, and you've, you've, uh, heard this before th that's where the mission's delivered every single day between the teacher and the student. Yep. And so we have to pay really close attention to it. But how we do it, we've learned so much this past year. I don't want to lose that investment. I don't want to, um, I don't want that muscle we've developed to atrophy uh, because it's really powerful to me. And it's what excites me about the, the coming years for independent education. Uh, for folks that haven't read my blog yet, you, you, you will see in there if you, if you go to it that I, I tell you that you're going to be beloved by your business office forever if you go into your business office and ask, so how can we maximize the investments from this past year oh. moving forward into the future? Don't you think, Jeff? Like, if that would be like music to every business officer's ears. Well, pre-pandemic, and you were a former director of technology, so I, I'm going to tread lightly here, but pre-pandemic, business officer's biggest, you know, grievance was investments in technology that stayed in the box and were in the corner of the classroom when they swung by to visit. And, and I'm not faulting anyone. I'm saying very often we got so excited about the technology, we really didn't build that bridge between um, the faculty using that technology and integrating it in the classroom, but absolutely um, leveraging investments that we've already made is music to the ears of business officers across the country, around the world. And that plays into the different scenarios that you're going to want to develop as academic yeah. leaders going yeah. to next year too, right? So yeah. scenario A might look like this, scenario B might look like this, scenario C might look like this. At least I think we're working with a little less ambiguity that we can start to do that scenario planning though. I think I think so. I think so. I think we know we know so much more. And Brad, and you know, Brad, I just marvel and because of our history and one schoolhouse is such a great partner at MBOA and I had the the great opportunity to serve on your board for a number of years but when I think about the number of faculty that have now been trained in this space it, it, what feels like overnight, and it was not without pain. It was not without stress. It was not an ideal circumstance, and I don't want to minimize any of that, but it happened. So now where do we go from here? I just think that's so exciting. And for people who do what you do um, and what your organization does every day, I just can't help but think you share that excitement as well. I do. I absolutely do. I think that it's it's super exciting to see um, where where education has evolved, mm -hmm. where teaching and learning has evolved over the last year. And at the same time, it's also super important to make sure that our faculty that are in our care get the rest and restora restoration. Oh my gosh. <laughs> coming off of this year before they're even asked to reflect. Uh, I agree. I agree. And my, and I hope my enthusiasm doesn't come off as, as uh, tone deaf. Absolutely. No. Anyone, anyone who's been on an independent school campus absolutely needs to uh, practice self-care, take a break, refill the tank, um, you know, take a big deep breath uh, before, before uh, really effectively meeting the challenges of the future. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, Jeff, let's let's switch to a, a slightly different topic. I, okay. You know, we've you've been you and I've been hearing and saying that the pandemic has fast forwarded trends that existed pre pandemic. And you've mentioned online learning is one of these things, but I think that there are some others. Can you talk to some of those trends that you're seeing and how they're impacting independent schools? Um, I think it's I think it's really interesting. I think um, some some schools experienced a uh, uh, an enrollment surge. Um, 
because they were so capable in delivering education five days a week. And that was really attractive to families in their communities. They had more confidence um, in independent schools being able to do that. And if it wasn't five day a week education, they had more confidence in independent schools delivering either a hybrid model or a completely online education. And so many of our schools um, saw a number of families come in and here's the business officer part. They came in after the financial aid dollars were already exhausted. Mm -hmm. So they were coming in as what we say, what we call full pay families or, or no need families. And so retention is, a, a, is key. So mm -hmm. that's been a really interesting kind of um, uh, un, uh, you know, circumstance uh, driven, driven by the pandemic. Um, so I think that's really exciting and, and we don't talk enough about retention. We focus so much on admissions and recruiting families and creating a pipeline, but, um, retention I think is going to be really key in the next year. And I think academic leaders can appreciate that retaining a family, especially retaining a full pay family, um, has an enormous, uh, budget impact on a school. Even, even one or two can have an enormous budget impact, um, uh, on the school. So very excited about those enrollment trends. Already spoke about um, how I think online learning is going to change things, um, uh, or at least should change how we think about our delivery of education in the future. Another one that doesn't get discussed as much is that I think um, the, the school as a physical plant and the school as a workplace I think that's changed a lot. And I'm really sp speaking mainly to my ad administrative colleagues who um, really we, we didn't think remote work was going to be possible. It was, yeah. was even an option in an independent school setting. And we learned that it really was. And we learned that there was some, um, we had to put some processes in place. We may have to have make initial, uh, some additional investments, but we have those investments now. And I think I think the independent schools and workplace has probably changed pretty dramatically as a result of the pandemic. Can we pause there for a second? Because I think you're right. I, I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's clear that every job does not have to be done on campus mm -hmm. within a school. And even the teaching jobs might look mm -hmm. a little bit more flexible um, than before. Add to that flexibility, pre-pandemic, we were getting questions from families around, you know, can you be flexible in this, that, or the other area? And pre-pandemic, our answer was almost certainly no yeah. um, to the flexibilities that they were asking. And then all of a sudden, during the pandemic, we did exactly what those families were asking. So it's going to be difficult <laughs> yeah. to go back and say no. So let's pause and talk about, like, flexibility from the HR job employer perspective, oh. but then let's also talk about, like, the flexibility that parents might be might be expecting. We'll start with the HR perspective. Um, I think from the HR perspective, I mean, if I was uh, director of HR at a school, I would really start to think about our policies and practices when it comes to employment at the school. And, you know, Brad, you and I both uh, run virtual organizations. And mm -hmm. so we have some experience here. And what I what I think the opportunity is, is look at look at how our recruitment pool may have expanded exponentially. Yes. Um, look at and look at and, and this is the part that's really hard. But in some markets, teachers living in close proximity to the schools they're working at is really challenging. So so imagine imagine that pressure being alleviated. But but overall, um, uh, I think the talent pool ha perhaps has increased if we take advantage of that. And I think independent schools being a workplace of choice for educators and administrators is exciting. I mean, uh, I think we've already successfully drawn uh, the best talent. I hope we have. I hope we continue to. But at what cost? And I think now we have other ways of making our schools even more attractive to uh, talented educators and administrators. I totally agree. I think that that's an underappreciated mm -hmm. um, advantage of uh, of having some type of remote capabilities, whether mm -hmm. it's part time or full time remote. Correct. Is that the talent pool just increases tremendously when you're able to do that? Yeah, it's really exciting. It is. And then for families, I know that you also serve on the EMA board, and so have kind of this perspective <laughs> coming in too um, about you know family flexibility and what families might be asking us and like how you're going to work between like that's a that's serious work between the business office the admissions office or enrollment office and the academic leaders to figure out like where are you going to be flexible and where aren't you going to be flexible with one is next year well you're going to be you, i think you did the pulse survey which gave us some really interesting data on how families feel about online learning even in a post-pandemic world so that continues to be encouraging 
um, that that can be a component of our education. And uh, the EMA uh, research and talking to families indicate that as well. It's not, it's not an overwhelming, I mean, it's not the vast majority, but it's a solid, everything I've seen, the data points to 25% to 33% of families are interested in having uh, some online education for their son or daughter going forward. So, um, you know, we must have gotten something right. And, and what, again, what does that opportunity mean for how we deliver education? And that what I'm saying underneath of that is that it has a financial impact, a positive financial impact if we begin to think about that. And, and again, the, out of the rush of the pandemic and the crisis of the pandemic, thoughtfully, you know, planfully, I don't think that's a word, but I'm using it a lot lately, but um, you know, that kind of let's, let's ratchet down the tempo, but think about, think about, think creatively about what, what opportunities have been presented to us. I'll share two that I've heard recently, Jeff, and maybe you've yeah. heard others. Uh, I've heard some schools thinking about having one virtual day a week, okay. even coming out of the pandemic. Um, and I've also heard of schools thinking about, uh, some schools have neighborhood enrollment caps. Oh, um, yes. They have agreed with the county or the <laughs> or the whatever that, that they will keep their enrollment at a certain level. They're thinking about going back and negotiating that based on the number oh. of people, like, just being one day. That's really, that's really interesting. And then, you know, I think Providence Country Day in North Carolina is doing an entire curriculum that's going to be only online mm -hmm. and then uh, obviously a face-to-face -face curriculum. Um, and really we're watching that to see how that impacts uh, their financial health in the long term. Yep. So really interesting, but think about how that opens up the funnel, offers education at a different price point, um, and and can be a, a a benefit to students and families and the school. Yeah, that's that's exactly why we're expanding those core curriculum classes that I talked to in the front. Yeah, we see that that a number of schools are going to want to have um, want to have the students be able to be enrolled that way while offering the wraparound support services for students uh, on their own campus. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, one other thing, Brad, that we've always talked about, um, the, uh, is the, is that flip classroom and talking about how, how we have the opportunity to use that face to face time very differently than, than we may have before because of what we're able to do in the online space. And, and, and I just feel like every faculty member that wants to build that connection with students and to be able to invest in that face-to-face -face time differently, um, I think also uh, presents an exciting opportunity. Absolutely. So folks, if you have questions for Jeff, please don't hesitate to put them into the q and I've got one more question and then Jeff, my crack research team has told me via chat here that 60% of schools in our last Pulse survey are planning to offer some form of fully online program next year for students not returning to campus. That's great. And what I was what I was putting my finger on was the demand from students and families yeah. that were the parents that were open to that. So I think that's really that's really interesting. And they um, you know, that's good that we're gonna meet, that we're gonna have both the the supply and the demand is a good thing. Absolutely. New York Times wrote an article about that just yesterday. <laughs> so, uh, Jeff, my last question for you is, what's the biggest lesson that you have from the pandemic overall? If you're trying to take a step back, I know that you're a reflective person and, and is often thinking in this way. So what's the biggest lesson that you've had from the pandemic? Uh, I, I have two, and I've touched on one, so I'll focus on the other. The one is collaboration and how important it is for our schools to be successful going forward. Um, and I think the second, and and I again, I'm not Pollyanna about this. Um, I, I understand the cost this past year, the human cost, the financial cost of schools being successful and getting through this this past year. But I do want us to reflect on the fact that we are far more creative, far more resilient, far more, far more agile than we ever gave ourselves credit for. Yeah. And so what, what are the possibilities? And this whole notion, you know, and you, Brad, you and I talking to, to leaders, and I understand where it comes from, but we can't do this or they'll never go for that. And all of these, these things that were kind of untouchable 
became touchable because yeah. they had to in order to deliver on our mission and serve our students and families. And so I just want to encourage all of us now that we've gotten that that what uh, Jim Collins calls the flywheel. Now that we've gotten that flywheel going, let's keep it going to solve some other big challenges that we also thought were untouchable, that we also thought, um, you know, we couldn't we couldn't go after. So again i i you know i i uh, i feel very hopeful and optimistic about how this is going to change pre-k through 12 independent education in the future i share that optimism too i yeah. share it too so one question that's come in and again folks use the q and a to put in any questions that you have how can someone who's early career in academic leadership in independent schools learn more about the business side of the school Oh my gosh. Um, I, that's such a, that's such a great question. You know that, um, you know, we do an online course called budget meets mission. That's ideal, uh, for academic leaders who want to learn more about the independent school business model. Um, we do, we offer it in partnership with our friends at one schoolhouse. Um, and it's not to turn you into a business officer. It's, it's, it's to give you enough information to get to the second part of my response is ask a lot of questions, yeah. meet with your business officer, talk with your head of school, school, uh, you know, ask questions about the finances of your school to understand them. And, and what you'll find is it's not as complicated as you may think it is. There's only a couple different revenue streams that are coming in that really um, contribute to the school's finances and only a few major expense items. And so um, I think if you, by asking questions, um, I we are we want you to be in the conversation because we need everyone's great best thinking to find solutions. So that would be my advice, my advice to a new academic leader. And I really appreciate that question. Well, and it goes to something, Jeff, that that you and I have been saying the kind of inverse to our different primary communities for a while. I know that you have been amazing at saying to business officers, it's no longer allowable to not engage with the academic side of the house. Sure. As business officers, you have to understand the core of what you do, the mission of what you do, the academic side of the house. And likewise, I've been saying to academic leaders for a long time, it's not okay to just say that's the work of the business office. Right. You understand their work too. I agree with that 100%. But I will tell you that um, I believe, and you know, I obviously, I'm a big fan of independent school business officers, but the more they understand the program and the more they understand the importance of the work you're trying to do, they're very resourceful individuals. Um, you, you allow them to be more resourceful by giving them that context and by helping them uh, have the understanding. And that and that's where, I don't wanna to be too corny, but that's where like the magic happens, right? That we're, we have these great educational ideas and then we find the resources and then we serve students even better. So that's, that's uh, I think that's a really cool thing. Excellent. Well, Jeff, I think that's a great place to end <laughs> this. I, I just wanna thank you. Um, and your team at MBOA for just the tremendous work again that that you've done to support the business and operations of independent schools, but really, really to help make sh school sure that schools can meet their missions as fully as possible. So thank well, you. We, we love what we do. We love who we serve. And I hope that comes through. But, uh, you know, at the risk of having a mutual admiration society, I mean, uh, Brad and the One Schoolhouse team, you know, many years ago, uh, we needed to uh, build out other ways to reach our members. And you were our partner uh, in the very beginning with delivering online courses. And we're so proud of this program that we have at MBOA. It keeps growing, it keeps evolving. Um, and it's such an exciting part of how we serve the independent school community. And, you know, I've said probably a thousand times, we could have never done that without your leadership and the partnership from your organization. And we're so appreciative of that as well. Well, thank you, Jeff. That's very kind. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We'll make sure that this webinar is up online here soon so that you can share it with anybody, any of your colleagues who happen to miss it today. Thank you all. Thanks, Brad.